Hello everybody, welcome back to the bench and welcome to our next project. What we have in front of us here is a really nice example of an RCA model 3-BX-671 and it is a shortwave receiver and when you look at it, look how nice this thing is, it's beautiful. This is all original, nobody's restored it or done anything to it, it's just been really well cared for. As soon as I opened this up and looked at it, it really reminded me of the Zenith Transoceanic series, like the H500, H600, those ones, which uh, I've done those before, and they're really nice radios. When they're properly aligned and the, the tubes are okay and everything, they're actually very good radios. This is the first one of these I've ever gotten to work on, so it'll be interesting to see the similarities between this and the, uh, the Zenith. It looks as if I see little perforations behind the dial and I'm kind of thinking that the speaker is going to actually be mounted behind the dial face which will be pretty cool. So uh, kind of just looking at a few of the controls it has a separate bass and treble control here so obviously this was designed for apparently to have decent sound. Uh, we have tuning. This is going to be your on, off, and volume, and your band select. So it's very simple. We only have those five controls on there. So it's simple and to the point. You have your little map on the top, very decorative. That's really a cool thing. A lot of these old radios had that, the old short waves. Back in the day that these were popular, shortwave listening was very uh, common, and you could pick up a lot of radio stations from around the world and listen to programming from different places. Now it was a very popular thing before television became very popular or so forth. And uh, it was a, a lot of people really got into that. Today you can still listen to shortwave, but there's not as much programming and it's not as diverse as it used to be. But you can still listen to it. And of course you have the regular broadcast band, your AM on this. So we're going to go through it and test it. I don't know if it works or not and I don't know what all it needs but that's what we're going to do in this video. So stay tuned and that's what we're doing. Now turning this around it's just as uh, plain and simple as it was looking at the front and the antenna actually has a little button here on the side. I'll show you. You press this little button and you can see the antenna at the top of the screen is just barely see it pops up and it's spring loaded and then of course it extends out and actually the antenna looks to be in pretty good shape and Bella sounds like she's got some complaining to do this morning I don't know if you can hear her in the background but she's barking at something up there I'll have to check on her anyway so to open this up this is hinged and you just pop it open and sure enough, there's your speaker. And uh, I stuck the printout inside it. I printed out the service manual I got from Nostalgia Air. Any of you that like working on these kind of radios, or you get, or you're interested in <clears throat> one day getting into working on these types of radios, a good website to know is uh, www.nostalgiaair. N o s t a l g i a a i r dot org, and they have a lot. They have a giant library of classic radios like this. The the service manual, schematics, alignment guides, all kinds of things. So it's a great resource. It's all free, and it's just one of those things where people sharing to be able to keep this hobby alive. So I recommend if you want to get into radio work like these kinds of radios great site to visit. Anyway, this is an AC-DC radio, meaning it can run on AC mains. In, in our instance, it's running on 110, 120 volt uh, US power. Or, using this funny little connector here, you can connect a battery pack that would slide down in here. And you could see by the size of that compartment under there, uh, how large of a battery this thing would actually hold. So uh, 
really cool. So this would run a long time on battery power. And you don't have to worry about picking up any hum from the mains, uh, which can happen with these types of radios. Down here is, a, is an antenna assembly. I'm not going to mess with this a whole lot because these are very brittle. The type of plastic they use to make these uh, is very brittle as it ages and it will crack. And this one is in exceptional shape. I don't want to mess with it. But what it is, is it's a window mount antenna. If you see, there's a couple little suction cups here. See them? And they're pretty hardened right now. They, I don't know if we could recondition them. or I know some places sell... Uh, reproduction replacements for these too so we'll look into that uh, comes with the twin lead wire which plugs in back here there's a there's a place that the antenna will plug into and uh, up here actually and you can stick this to the window that was the idea and it would improve your reception so really neat again this was something that that Zenith was doing with the they called it the wave magnet they had this type and they had a, a big flat uh, wound antenna as well with the suction cups so just a couple things to operate this on DC is pretty interesting you have to take this plug and you plug it into here which jumpers a couple of <laughs> contacts together and it bypasses the AC mains and then connects this battery connector which I believe goes down to a battery down here which of course those are unobtainium but uh, I know there's people making reproductions of them you can print you know a label out and then paste it to some cardboard cut out the cardboard and then load it with modern batteries inside um, but I don't think the owner's interested in that. He's really interested in just being able to listen to this and use it uh, on the AC mains. So that's what we're going to look at. So anyway, we're going to do our normal proceed with caution. And we're going to try to power this up. Uh, it's in such phenomenal shape. Uh, I almost think it'll probably just turn on and work. But we'll see. Uh, one thing I see here is with these little perforations in here. Notice on the top and the back. This is going to have a selenium rectifier in it. What is a selenium rectifier? <laughs> well, that's an old type of diode. And a lot of you that are probably interested in this channel that watch it, probably you all know what a diode is. I'll show you one. This is a modern diode. And you can see how tiny it is. And it actually can handle a peak reverse voltage of up to 1,000 volts. So it's amazing something this small and it can handle up to one amp of current. Well prior to these silicon diodes they made diodes out of a material called selenium and selenium has some different properties than silicon and the selenium discs that they use in these are kinda large and they have fins in them because they get they actually generate heat that's why you see these little holes in here. So they can go bad. As the selenium ages and as the, the connection between the little plates, because they're kind of stacked plates, the higher the voltage it has to handle, the more plates they're going to stack, and they're in the bigger the diameter of the selenium. Uh, it actually creates heat. And because of that heat, when I'm actually speaking backwards right now, uh, there's a, there is quite a voltage drop across a selenium rectifier. The way I should word that is there's a voltage drop across the selenium rectifier and that voltage drop is because the the resistance in there is converting the electrical energy into heat energy. So long story short this will drop your AC mains a few volts. May it could be up to 10 or 15 or more volts uh, unlike a silicon diode which will only drop about 0.7 volts so something to think about when we go to replace this because this will get replaced these tend to fail when they get old and they fail pretty badly they burn up and they smell really bad and any of you that ever experienced that you'll know what I'm talking about so anyway let's uh, just see if it works we're gonna proceed with caution and we're just gonna use a dim bulb we're not gonna get fancy with anything here we're just going to put a little current limiting bulb in here and turn it on and see if we get power. 
So we now have the radio turned back around, the power is turned off, and I have it connected to my current limiting bulb. And you can see that. Any of you that watch my channel, you know what I'm talking about. It's just this light bulb here, and I've swapped out the 100 watt bulb for a smaller one. This is only like a 60 watt, I think. You can use a 60 or a 40. With these little, these little radios like this, they don't draw much current, so you can put a smaller bulb in there to give you a little better current limiting, um, which plugs into this socket. And all that's happening, um, and I know a million times people have gone over this on YouTube, essentially all this is is an electrical outlet, and the, the hot side of, of this terminal here, of the AC mains line, we cut that hot side and we put this light bulb in series with this. So if there's a dead short on this radio, what will happen is this light bulb will absorb all the current. It'll light up brightly, but it won't hurt anything. You won't blow any breakers, you won't burn up any wires it'll just light up the light bulb. Uh, however, since this is a 60 watt light bulb, uh, and this radio probably only draws, you know, 10 or 15 watts or something, maybe a little more because of the tubes and the filaments in them, it's not going to, it will be able to pass enough current to power the radio. So it'll power the radio, but won't allow it to be damaged from shorts or anything like that. So that's the principle of using a dim bulb or a current limiting bulb tester. So now we're plugged in and I'm going to lock the camera down here. Let's turn this thing on. And by the way, these have, they're like one or two volt filaments in the uh, tubes and what you'll find out is these will turn on almost as quickly as a solid state radio so when we turn it on within maybe five seconds we should start hearing some sound and I have nothing on the light bulb it's completely totally dim which tells me it the light bulb should glow very very slightly and that's why I use a clear globe on the light bulb if you use a white frosted globe you can't really see the filament if it's very very dim usually if this is powering up properly you'll get an extremely dim glow on the bulb indicating that there is some current flowing through the bulb filament there's no glow whatsoever and there's no sound on the radio so before we even take anything apart, we already know that we're probably not even getting power to something. Now there's a lot of reasons why, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit before we open it up. So here's the schematic diagram of the entire radio. And the part we're going to focus on uh, in the beginning, because we have no power at all to the radio, we have to kind of think about what that limits us to as being to being the problem if you're not getting any sound whatsoever then either a you have something wrong with the power supply itself which is probably where your issue is or B it could be something as simple as you know one of the tubes or something is bad if this radio is a series strung radio then that will cause that to happen and you can see just by looking at the schematic the power comes in here and it goes up to this first filament then it goes around and out then it goes to the next filament you can kind of see here and around and out and to the next filament and around and out so this is pretty much a series strung radio uh, so what does that mean? Well, what that means is if one of these filaments should go out, then all of them will go out and you will have no power to the radio. So we, it could be as simple as a bad vacuum tube with an open filament. The other thing is on these types of AC-DC radios, especially this one, if we zoom in a little bit, and we look at the power supply section, you can see how complicated this is. 
So your AC mains comes in here, you have this little connector plug for the battery, and this whole circuit here, if you plug this in to the little socket, you can see there are switches and things in here. See this little do dotted line? When you push this AC mains plug into that little socket I showed you on the back of the chassis, it pushes in, a, it activates a little switch and that switch disconnects, it, it connects this power to your batteries and it also connects the other t battery terminal so it gives you two separate power sources one for the filaments and one for the B plus and when you unplug it it switches back over and it uses a series of dropping resistors and so forth to give you your two voltages and it loops everything through the selenium rectifier for your DC uh, B plus. So all of this stuff here can fail. So the first thing we want to check is are we getting continuity from this power cord through this switch out to the filament string. If we don't then there's no use in messing around with tubes and so forth yet. If we are fairly confident that the power is actually getting out to the filaments then we, we will pull the tubes and we'll actually check and see if we have an open filament and I'll show you how to look at that. So the first thing we want to do is let's get the chassis out of the radio so we can work on it a little better. Chassis removal on this is relatively simple. Now one of the things you have to really be careful when working on these, this is very very thin wood. You can see how thin it is compared to my fingers, right? And the only thing that this hinge is held on here by is these four screws, two here and two here on these two hinges. This is a, and if you notice, the grain is running like this. And of course, I think this is plywood. Yeah, it is plywood, so you do have some grain strength, but these will break very, very easily. They'll rip out. So you want to make sure that you push your radio back on your bench a little bit so the weight of this is being supported by your bench and don't lean your hands on here when you take the screws out. The Some of the old uh, zeniths are the same way. You have to be really careful because these break, they're very delicate when they're apart like this. They're really not designed to be handled roughly when they're apart. So there's four screws and they have these little shoulder washers on them and slotted holes and you'll see them when I get the chassis out. I've taken the front two out. You have to kind of reach under here with your screwdriver and then these last two we're going to take out and you have to kind of support the chassis while you're taking these last screws out. You can see and there goes Bella again. Boy, she's not happy with something up there. We have somebody restoring our front porch and I think that might be he might be here and Bella wants to go visit him because you know how friendly she is okay so this drops down and just comes straight out like that and we are pretty much free so let me get this all moved and get the camera out of the way so I can get this case out of the way and we'll be right back So this is just the way I love to see these radios. This is kind of <laughs> the best scenario you could have. I see dirt in here and a little bit of rust, just a tiny bit. And you can see the dirt on my finger. So there's original dirt in here. But this is a very, very original radio. And look at the immaculate condition it's in. It's beautiful. So uh, this is definitely a radio worth taking the time to properly clean it up and properly restore it because this is a beautiful radio. It'll be a showpiece, but it's also going to be a working showpiece that'll give lot, many more years <laughs> of listening pleasure. The only thing we have to watch out for is silver mica, silver mica disease in the two IF cans. Hopefully they'll be okay, but if they're not, we'll have to rebuild them. Anyway, that's way down the road now. <laughs> first things first, why aren't we getting power? So we're now looking down at what we were talking about earlier with the power cord. So here's your mains cord right here. You can see it leading in. 
and here's that little socket that you're supposed to plug this into when you want to run it on on battery so you can see when you plug this cord in here there's a switch and see that switch it's spring loaded down here and what they did was they angle cut the slider on the switch the little thing that you would usually use your finger to move and as the plug pushes in there it shoves this over and it moves the slide switch over against the spring when you pull it back out the spring retracts it back over to here and if that spring goes bad or if the contacts go bad it won't permit this thing to go back into AC mains mode and that's a common problem with these kinds of radios that have this so uh, that was the first thing I wanted to check and it looks to be working properly of course till we get the bottom out we're not going to know you know look at the bottom of the chassis we're not going to know if it's everything's working properly but that's one good sign it's in good condition and it's mechanically working so there's how many screws it takes just to get this bottom cover off and I don't believe this covers ever been off when I look at the places where the screws were you can see that the aluminum has not been gouged at all from the screws being in and out the screws were also very tight and uh, you can tell that they haven't been wallered out from you know taken out and putting back in so many times Well, right off the bat, I can tell this radio has never been serviced. And I have it kind of precariously on its back here right now. And I have several things right that I see right away that are very concerning. First of all, all of the capacitors here, the paper caps, are these bumblebee capacitors. And they are notorious for leaking. They fail. They will all need to be replaced. Uh, I don't even care if they're reading good or not, they get replaced. And we've talked about this many, many times. Uh, the way they're made up, the paper and the wax and the foil and everything causes a chemical reaction because of the acids in the paper, and it causes the paper to break down, and it causes the capacitor to become resistive. It turns more into a resistor than a capacitor. Even if your capacitor checker reads that it has capacitance still it doesn't mean that this will that these will not leak act as a resistor and anything that is a decoupling capacitor that is designed to block the DC between two tubes uh, that resistance will actually cause the tube to bias incorrectly and it will damage the tube so we never want to risk that so even though these look pretty we're going to replace them the other thing is there's a jumper in here and I think this is for the battery pack you can see it right here and there's these little contacts I don't know if I can zoom in on this or not you can see these little contacts here and this is right in line with the mains and this is a bypass so in other words you can plug something in here we'll look in the schematic what this does but this is actually a contact and you can see it kind of it's loose and if something if it's not making good contact here it will not allow the current to get from this cord over to this side so we're going to measure that it definitely needs clean because it definitely looks kind of tarnished and corroded a little bit we have the across the line capacitor which is bad so we got to get rid of that and more importantly I noticed this right away when I opened it I don't know how close I can zoom in before the focus gets out of whack but take a look at this so you have this ceramic disc that goes over to here and it's connected to this tab which if you notice is chassis it's coming around here and it's directly shorting onto this terminal of this capacitor which goes over to here so essentially we're shorting this to chassis ground that looks factory that's been like that and I'm sure that somehow affected the the functionality of this radio I can guarantee it so and you can see how tightly packed this radio is 
I mean, everything is just crammed in here, especially over here. Look at that. So we're going to have some work. The other thing, these sand cast resistors, every one of them do this. See how that green corrosion there? When you see these sand resistors, cut them out and replace them. This actually has two resistors in one, if you look. So we're going to have to replace this with two resistors. And this is your voltage dropping resistor for your selenium rectifier. So here's that selenium rectifier we were talking about. And you can see this is a voltage dropping resistor to match your incoming mains. So if you have 110 volts versus 125 volts, you can switch between them. And this resistor just drops the voltage. These go bad. This corrosion will go all the way in here and the resistor will open and it will no longer have conductance. So this could be a problem too. So it's time to get the meter out and start measuring. Well, I figured since this is an old radio, a classic, I'm going to use an old type of test equipment. And this is called, well, this is technically called a vacuum tube voltmeter, a VTVM. Uh, they, there's many different kinds. I have a bunch of them. <laughs> I just thought I'd get this old B&K out. And uh, they're really handy for, for working on this type of gear. You don't need one. You can use a digital meter and it will work fine. Um, but it's really nice to have the big meter face and to have the big needle. Um, you'll see how easy it is when you get deflection to just see if there's continuity or to check relative resistances and things. It's very quick and uh, it's a good tool to have. And these can be purchased online. You can find them you know, on eBay or yard sales, flea markets, uh, swap meets, ham fests, all kinds of places. People are discarding these because they don't know what they are or they're not interested in them anymore. And they're great pieces of test equipment. So let's use it. What I have right now is I have the meter connected to, it's in ohms mode, as you can see, so we're checking continuity and resistance. And I have the one leg of the AC mains line uh, that goes into here. So we're going to check, first of all, to make sure the power cord is good. If we touch this down here, we can see it's good because the needle moves, right? And there's no resistance. It goes all the way down to zero ohms. So now let's move over to going through these contacts and onto this side and we can see we have continuity so these little contacts are actually good they're making contact see that touching right here now if we move our lead to the other side and that's the other wire it's coming across here and going over to here to the switch and if I push that you can see we have continuity so we know our power cord is good so now let's turn the radio on so that's turning the switch on and let's measure through and see if the switch has continuity and it does so if we turn this back off it's good. If we go over here there's another switch here and we'll check it and this is not connected directly to the mains. We'll have to look on the schematic to show you what it is and you can see it has continuity and if I turn it off and it's working There you go. Kind of hard to do this around the camera. So good news is our power switch is good. That terminal right there is good. Our power cord is good. So now let's go back and see if we have continuity from one side of the mains cord to the other. We could have started with this test. And you can see there's absolutely no continuity. Now that might be normal because remember we have this selenium rectifier over here and it's in the circuit so there could be there is a possibility that that's why we're not seeing anything 
So let's get back over here and let's continue tra tracing this. So this red wire right here, and I'm not even looking at schematics yet, it comes around here over to here and it goes right over here to this selenium rectifier. So let's see if we can back off a little bit, move the camera over a little bit, keeping everything in view. There we go. And let's make sure it gets over to here. And it does. So that's good. Now, I don't think our meter is going to be able to measure through this selenium rectifier. So let's check and see. We're going to check both ways. Whoop. Working around the camera here. We just want to make sure. And again, I don't think we're going to get a reading with this meter. And of course, we have high resistance. So we're at reading times 10,000, and we're at about 60, so that's about 60, 62K of resistance, 62,000 ohms in that direction. And if we read the other direction, which is over here, which this is awkward. Here we go. And you can see there's no resist almost no resistance in that direction, very little. So the rectifier may or may not be bad. Let's do another little test. So we're going to use a tool called my little diode testing jig. We use these in the field a lot um, on the high voltage tanks in x-ray machines to test the high voltage resistors or diodes because your meter doesn't have enough energy to break down the diode and test it. So what this consists of is a just a two wire extension cord. You see just a standard extension cord. And what we do is in the middle of the line let me move this here. You can see I've stripped the, the line apart, peeled the two conductors apart, and I cut the one wire in half. So I would definitely be remiss if I didn't do a little extra safety disclaimer with this test device. We have used these for many years out in the field, and they have really helped me a lot in troubleshooting diodes. Um, for shorts, for opens, and for functionality. But the thing you have to understand is this is plugging into your mains line and these wires right here are literally connected to this plug. So there is mains voltage on these two probes whenever this is plugged in. Now the technique that I showed you I was demonstrating this quickly on the camera. I, I was being careful and I was comfortable using this device. But understand, my recommendation is whenever you're going to connect these or disconnect these, always unplug this from the outlet, connect it to your device under test, move your hands away from it, and then plug it back in and observe the lamp to see uh, what kind of light you're getting. I have to put this in here because I just want to, I don't want anybody accidentally uh, getting <laughs> a nasty bite off of this. Even though this bulb is in here, it doesn't matter. You're still going to have mains voltage here and you can still get a really nasty shock. So that's my disclaimer. Do this at your own risk. If you're comfortable working around electrical devices and you know all the safety things, it's just like the uh, beginning of my, every one of my, I have a disclaimer at the front of every video that I post, and I do that for a reason. So there you have it. Again, thanks a lot. See that? I cut it and put these little alligator crocodile clips on it. And the idea is... 
on the other end you plug in a little night light bulb now you want a very very low wattage bulb this is only a four there's there's four watt and seven watt bulbs and I think this one's a four watt but you want just a little night light like this with an incandescent bulb this is very important it has to be incandescent do not use an LED now when we plug this in we have three different things that can happen besides shocking ourselves so if there's no connection so in other words this connection is broken right so you cannot have your mains voltage getting to the bulb because we interrupted it right by cutting the cord but if these are put together the bulb will come on and that's full brightness okay and don't do what I'm doing right now because I'm getting close to these leads and you can get a shock and I certainly wouldn't want to see anybody get shocked okay uh, I am being careful but uh, just know that the other thing would so we have open circuit short circuit see how bright the bulb is and if you have a diode which let me get a diode and we connect a diode to this the bulb is half brightness because you're only getting a half wave in other words you're only getting half of the AC sine wave so this is only turned on half of the time during half of the cycle because the diode is blocking the other half so you can see how dim it is there and how bright it is there see the difference now the cameras actually compensating for the light difference so it's not as as dramatic <laughs> as it is in real life but there's a big difference between uh, shorted and half wave so doing that we're going to connect this into here and we're going to look and see so we'll put one end of this on our power cord on our mains cord because we know we have continuity all the way out to the selenium rectifier I'm trying to work around this camera and see what I'm doing at the same time Let me put it on this way and slide the little insulator over there and then I'm going to hold this bulb here and I'm going to touch the one side and we have full brightness see that and then the other side should be half brightness if it's working and it is you see that so we just proved with just a very simple thing that you could buy at the dollar store um, good piece of test equipment we know that our selenium rectifier is working so again did you notice with the meter you really couldn't check it and even if you tried it with diode check on your uh, other meter like on the uh, the your digital meter it probably wouldn't check it properly either some of the older uh, volt ohm meters the analog ones that had two different batteries some of them had like a higher voltage cell for the higher resistance some of those will, will work somewhat but again it's hit and miss this works every time it will test it and since it's not applying any high energy to the device it's not going to damage it unless it's a really really delicate signal diode or something so there's another little tip how to check these selenium rectifiers so now that we know we have good power out to the power cord through this little jumper and all the way over through our selenium rectifier the next thing we want to check is this sand resistor again you see how green and corroded this thing is I mean it's pretty bad uh, you can kind of rub this off but what's going to happen is this is just going to snap in half it's going to need replaced but for right now all we care about is does it work so I have the negative terminal of my meter connected to one side of the resistor over here you can see just down in the corner of the image you can see it and we're just going to read this is two resistors in series is what it is you can see there's three wires there's one wire going on to the rectifier another wire going on to one side of the switch and another wire going on the other side of the switch and all that this switch does is it shorts out this section of the resistor so we either can have the whole resistor 
or half of the resistor and that's for our two two different voltage levels you know for your mains voltage so if we measure to this first one we have 8 on the ohm scale we're set to times 10 8 times 10 is 80 so this is about 80 ohms and if we go to the next section it's about 138 135 ohms somewhere around there so you can see that it's two different it, you're reading through the whole resistor or half of the resistor by doing that the good news is this resistor has continuity and it works so let's take a look at this schematic for a minute so right down here where the power cord is you know, that little jumper there those little those little contacts those are up here you can see right there where it plugs in and you can see there's a module that goes in here that consists of a selenium rectifier that's what SR stands for another one and two resistors and a slide switch and what this is in there for is it's to convert this radio from 110 volt or 117 volt mains to European power which is 250 volts see 254 volts DC 200 and what is that 54 volts AC so and then it allows you to slide this switch and convert it back to 117 volts if you want so by having this extra this was an optional module that plugged into there by having this module you could literally work run this radio anywhere in the world it can run on anywhere from 105 volts AC you can see down here up to 117 or even up to 250 volts so you don't need this if you're using the 100 and 115 volt batteries or you're using 115 volt mains you don't need this so over here in the United States you wouldn't need this module but for Europe you would use this now right here is that sand resistor we were looking at and see the tap in the middle of it and we had it's saying 75 ohms on one end and 55 on the other and if you remember we were reading somewhere in the line of 80 ohms so that's very close and you can see it comes right off the selenium rectifier here and then the second section is 55 ohms so 75 plus 55 is what we were reading from here to here so it's good so now the next thing we have to look at is our capacitors and this resistor now this one is called a canned ohm resistor c-a-n-d-o-h-m reason they call it that is it's a wire wound resistor that has an insulator wrapped around it wrapped around the form with the wire wound stuff with the tungsten and then a metal can crimped around it and it's designed to, to carry a lot of wattage a lot of power so it can dissipate a lot of heat and then normally you would mount this to the chassis of the radio to carry away the excess heat so this is a power dropping resistor and you can see it's right in the middle of your capacitor filters so let's take a look at that now if we look here's these let's move back over a little bit so here's these black cloth covered wires there's three of them and they go through this little hole down here and they lead over to this little thing down here see the metal can that square rectangular can right there in the middle of this image that is a can dome resistor so let's put this back down and one the one end goes to the output of the selenium rectifier which is here and you can see that big thick insulated wire right here that I'm touching so I have my negative probe on there the other two go to this switch which is good I have continuity and you saw the little deflection so that was the capacitor we were looking at and the other one goes over to this capacitor here and you can see they're both good so all of our resistors are good uh, if we look at our switch here 
we do have continuity through the switch contacts and we can move over here and just kind of measure what we have so we have we connect on so we have nothing here and nothing here so I'm starting to wonder that switch right there doesn't seem to have continuity on it does it because if I go here to here I have it but if I go to either side of the slide switch I have nothing so right there could be a bad switch let's go over to this one this side I have resistance in this way on this side and I have nothing on this side so let's see yep there's nothing there it is there okay so the two switches must be configured differently so if I go from this must be the middle okay so they're not in line with one another there it is okay switch is good and if we plug the cord in it should move the switch over like that now that side has continuity this side does not so that's good that one changed properly and if I go over to here that side has continuity now and this one doesn't just reading resistance through stuff through components so the switch is good there you have it so now we've proven that our whole power supply a is not shorted and B does not have any opens so all of this is good that's what we just checked everything so we checked the sand resistor the selenium rectifier this switch here we checked our power cord we checked this switch we checked the can dome resistor everything is good so now we need to look at up here perhaps we have an open filament troubleshooting the filaments on this uh, the filament string on this radio is very simple the reason being is all of the tubes no matter what they are all of them have their filaments on pins 1 and pin 7 so really all we have to do is start at the very end which would be the output tube for the speaker so here's your output transformer <laughs> there's the output tube buried way way under here and I'm on the first pin I'm on pin 7 here and I'm going to go to pin 1 and you can see the meter moves all the way over it's going to be very low resistance because the uh, the filament is a 1 volt filament so if I go down to the next tube they're all in series so I should be able to read all the way through the string so here's the next one and you can see there it is I have that here's the next one I have that go over to the next one here I'm just going to pins 1 and 7 of all of them and I really don't care what order I'm in I just want to make sure it rings all the way through them all and then clear over to the end I have right there and there and we have right there wait a second make sure I get on it and I'm not reading on this one there it is there and I'm not getting through this one so perhaps we found a bad tube so there's the one side and there's the other side there it is okay I just wasn't touching it good I wasn't getting on it properly there it is yep filaments are all good on the tubes 
Okay, we're all set up. Let's uh, turn this thing on and check some voltages now. So going to the schematic, we're going to start out with the B+. Plus, and we're going to check and see. So right here, we go through this, through the selenium rectifier. And all in this area, we should be able to see our B plus going through here. There's the can dome resistor. There's the little sand resistor. So we should have our voltages in here. So let's plug this in. I'm still using the dim bulb tester. And the negative probe, as you can see, I have connected to the negative of this capacitor. And this capacitor is a insulated capacitor. It's isolated, I should say. And what I mean by that is there is a fiber wafer uh, little mounting gasket that mounts to the chassis and then the capacitor mounts to that and then there is actually even a insulating paper cover over the capacitor itself. So it is totally isolated from chassis. So this is a floating, a floating ground system in that you don't have, uh, it's kind of not, it, it's, it is a little bit of a hot chassis set, but not as bad. So let's plug this in. And again, we still have the dim bulb. And let's move our voltage up. Eh, let's go to 150 volt range. And the first thing we want to look at is the output of the selenium rectifier. And you can see that's kind of low right there, but it is there. So in the 150 volt range, we're really not even quite getting 90 volts. So there's your 9, and you're talking about 90 volts. So uh, it's pretty low before it even gets out to the rest of the radio. But of course, because this runs on batteries, we don't know. This might be a 96 volt uh, radio because of these, these little small tubes. So that might be normal. So if we go to our first sand resistor output, we can measure that there. And we can measure it here. So we are getting output from that. And so there's voltage, at least we know, getting through here. So we're now switched back over to ohms mode on our meter. And if we look here, if we start right here, this, this wire right here goes to this first capacitor. So I'm connected right there with my negative lead. And if I go from there to this one, which is right up here, I should see approximately 950 ohms. So if I go from here to here, and you can see, and we got other circuitry in there, you know, capacitors and things messing with us, but we have roughly around 1K or so. Yeah. So that's not too bad. Again, we're on reading times 100, and we're looking at this top scale, so 900 and 1,000 ohms would be somewhere between here and here. Now, if I go to the next section, it should be an additional 950 ohms for a total of 1,900 ohms. So there should be almost 2K from here to here. So if I go down on this switch, and that 20 times 100 would be 2,000, correct? So right about here, we have 2K. So the resistor is reading a little bit high, but that's normal. Uh, again, these do not have very good tolerance ranges. It's, some of them are 10 or even 20% tolerance. So that's good. All right, so now we have a new diode installed. Look how tiny that is compared to that selenium. And down in the bottom, I have a 100 ohm resistor, and a, up here I have a 47 ohm resistor. So these two resistors uh, are taking the place of that two position or two section can res or uh, sand resistor that was in there. 
Now, um, it's a little bit higher than we need, but it should be, the voltage should be a little bit lower than the schematic is calling for. And so, for instance, we should have about 108 volts uh, coming out of both resistors together, which would be this part right here. And if you look, well, I'm getting just just under 100, about 97 volts. But that's with the dim bulb. And if I take the dim bulb out of the circuit, there you go. You got about 100 and about 102 volts right there now. And I go to this side. And I have a little bit higher, I have more like 108, which is where we should be. So our voltage is perfect right now. I'm going to put that dim bulb back on just in case something goes wrong. Now, if we're not getting any sound now, there's a possibility that we're not getting filaments. So we're going to check our filament voltage, although I'm almost positive it would be here. So let's look at that. And if I go from here to here, and of course we have to turn the voltage way down to 1.5 volt scale. And if you look, I have about one point, just under 1.1 volts. So we have filaments, but we are not getting sound. And if we're not getting sound, my guess is that we don't have local oscillator. Now, if I look up here on this pin, this is the first IF coming out of the mixer tube. And it would help if I would set it to the correct voltage. And if I look here, it should be 92 volts. And you can see with the dim bulb, it's right around 90. And it goes up to 92 when I uh, switch the bulb out. So our voltages are all here, and our sound is not. So let's just look at something dumb. Let's unplug it. And we're going to look and make sure that the speaker is good. How about that? I'm trying not to use oscilloscopes and things here because I want to try to use some simple tools on this. Um, we may have to get resort to that, but I'm not going to unless we really have to. I'd rather try to do this the old way. So we're going to go down to about one ohm. And can you hear that? There's your speaker. So the speaker is good. And we can also look at the output transformer. But uh, again, we're going to uh, use some other tricks to uh, check our local oscillator, I think. I now have this radio turned on, and lo and behold, turning the volume up, I'm getting some sound now. Let me move the microphone the other direction so you can hear it. Sorry about the noise here. Okay. And you can hear just a little bit of static. And it sounds like something's wrong. We might have uh, silver mica. But now if I turn, I have another radio here, just this AM radio. Watch, I have it in proximity of this. Watch when I turn this over here. You hear that? That's This radio is turned all the way down. So you're not hearing this. See, it's this one. When I turn the volume down. And you can see, and if I tune this one. So I'm getting the impression that maybe we are not getting local oscillator on this radio or one of these capacitors is bad. But the good news is we are getting some sound now where we weren't getting it before. Well, where I think we are now is to a point where the resistors and all of these capacitors are interfering with uh, with the performance of this radio. One thing I'll direct you to here, we're going to kind of focus in on this across the line cap. And if you look, you can see how wet that is. Yeah, it's all leaky. 
and there's not these are not liquid filled capacitors what that is is that's the wax and so forth inside of them melting and leaking um, and that's a common problem with these bumblebee capacitors when you when they age the the paper and foil and everything that they're made up of the paper actually has acid in it it breaks down and as I said earlier it makes these become resistive they act more like resistors than capacitors so these bumblebee caps really most of the time need to be replaced so those all need done this is going to be a pretty major restoration to do this but that's what we're here for so uh, I think our next thing is we have a functioning radio now we were able to pick up some stations uh, I don't think we have silver mica disease in the IF transformers at least I don't hear that snap crackle pop that you hear usually um, that remains to be seen but right now I think this radio is really in need of a recap and it should and then do an alignment and should bring it back to life now that's <laughs> gonna be a lot of fun and we have to be really careful when we're down here in the actual uh, alignment section these coils are extremely delicate and if you break any of these little litz wires or short anything out or move anything in here we can have all kinds of problems so well our work is cut out for us well I think I got most of it in the shot here so it looks much better now we got all of those uh, bumblebee capacitors removed and pretty much all of them were reading high but uh, I think this is really what we needed so what I've done is I've taken the signal generator and connected it to the antenna input you can kind of see right over here and I have the signal generator set at 455 kilohertz negative 10 dBm which is a really hot signal and I'm only doing 30 percent modulation and if we turn this up you can hear it we have got 455 kilohertz now here's the thing uh, I'm gonna set I'm gonna try to adjust the IF but I really don't want to listen to that annoying speaker so here's a little trick this actually has a headphone output or an external speaker output and it's a quarter inch jack so what I have here is just a quarter inch jack that has just a 10 ohm you can use an 8 or 10 ohm resistor and we can plug this right in here hopefully without electrocuting ourselves and bring the meter over and we should be able to listen to this now and see now you can see the you can visualize it but you don't have to listen to it now because it would be really loud if we were listening to it right now so now we're going to adjust there's only two IF coils and each one has a primary and secondary so we'll go in here and we'll just do one at a time and I'm pretty sure these are peaked out already they don't really need let's see can you see that so let's turn it and you can see I'm dropping let's go the other way you're going back okay so right about there and you can see just putting the tool in there uh, um, affects it I think that's about as close as you're gonna get okay let's do the top one and I'm not sure if this is the way the instructions tell us to do it that's pretty good but it will work so let's get this other now we'll do the tops of the coils Yeah, 
the wrong way. Oh, super shot right about there. And the last one. And I can tell you these were pretty much spot on to begin with here. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Okay. Now that we have that done, we can put the bottom cover, which will reduce all the noise and everything, and we can go and do some spot checks on the uh, on these bands down here. Now I'm I'm thinking that all of these slugs down here are good, and we're not going to have to touch them. And we're hoping we don't have to touch them because that can be a real pain, and they're very very delicate. Uh, because these are just cardboard tubes with ferrite slugs in them a lot of times they get stuck and if you turn it they'll snap right off so hopefully we won't have to adjust these they'll be good just how they are so let me get the bottom cover on and we'll go through some tests